I'm sure most of you guys have probably seen by now the video that I did on Joshua Collins and some of the disappointment that I felt when, um, when it seemed as though he didn't know what the fuck he was doing when it came to electoral efficacy. And it made me think, like, I still haven't actually done... Uh, I still haven't actually done any videos on how I want to establish socialism in the United States. And a lot of people have criticized me for that. And I keep saying, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Like, what would you do? Like, what's your actual game plan, you know? A lot of people, Destiny criticized me for this too. Destiny criticized me. Like, you want to talk about, like, this society. You want to talk about what's here. But you can't talk about how to get to that point, okay? So I want to talk about that, all right? I'm going to try and keep this as expedient as possible, all right? And we're going to do it using paint. But before we get to the paint, I need to talk about something very important to you. Okay? Um, why do I want to be a socialist? Okay? So, on a very, very fundamental level, I am, I, a lot of, I get called a lot of things. Socialist, market socialist, libertarian, socialist, leftist, anarchist, anarcho-syndicalist, mutualist. There are a lot of things that I get called. Broadly speaking, here are my opinions, okay? The progress of history is slow, you know? Imagine we live in like a slave state, like like uh, Egypt, you know, back in back in 2000 BC or something like that. If I lived in such a society, do you think if I was intelligent enough to know what socialism was, I could meaningfully advocate for its implementation right then and there? Probably not. Because is if we agree, generally speaking, with historical materialism, the idea is that our, the material relationships of society advance uh, oh, sorry, advance to a point where we can then make meaningful progress. Marx agreed that socialism was a necessary step in moving society forward. And I agree with him on that, because I think that socialism did a pretty excellent job of codifying the development of um, a modern industrial economy, which socialism can then take advantage of. Now, even if you don't agree generally with those ideas, even if that is the case, um, the fact remains nonetheless that, like, you can't just... Wait, did I not say... Did I say... What did I say? Cap whatever I said, I mean capitalism. My bad. I said socialism when I meant liberalism. Capitalism. My apologies. Socialism will overtake socialism. Ah, well, that might happen too. Ah, yeah. Nonstop comrade. Nonstop warfare, comrades. Marx believed that capitalism had a purpose to serve, and I think I generally agree with that. I would also agree that feudalism was a necessary step in removing power away from, like, the divine right of absolute monarchs, and the divine right of absolute monarchs were probably a superior system to, like, uh, like, like, div like, uh, uh, like theological confederacies or like, uh, or like the, the Roman Empire, maybe. It, like, there's a progression over time with history, and it's all very complicated and... I'm not a, a fucking historian, so I'm not going to focus on that. I want to focus on today. Right now, today, we live in a capitalist society, a laissez-faire capitalist society, which means that, generally speaking, our economic system is oriented around the idea that any individual can acquire capital privately, so money that they can use to turn into more money, to turn into more, you know, um, capital, and that this can be done, anyone can do this. That's unique. It didn't used to be that case, you know. Back in the feudal days, not anyone could just become a successful businessman. And even if you did become successful, you were usually made subservient. Libraven, it's called laissez-faire capitalism as opposed to mercantile capitalism. It doesn't mean that it's literally laissez-faire with no restrictions whatsoever in the market. It's a juxtaposition to the former system of capitalism. Mercantile capitalism meant that there was more of a, um, a, a union, like an orientation between the, the relationship between merchants and the state, or I guess back then it would be like the monarchy um and i don't like this system very much i think it's kind of cringe basically the main problem that i have with capitalism is that it's not democratic and that it creates inequality those are my main issues now when i say it's not democratic what i mean by that are two fundamental things one the existence of people with more capital than others means that our political electoral democratic system is going to be made subservient to the interests of some people more so than the interests of other people. I.e., if you're super wealthy and you can create super PACs and you can create like lobbying groups and you can represent your interests in Washington, you're probably going to have more of an influence on the political sphere than an average Joe working at a fucking, uh, you know, uh, Starbucks in Chicago. 
probably, generally speaking. And the second reason I say it's undemocratic is because workplaces are authoritarian. They are. Like, really think about it. We live in a democratic society. Democracy works great for our electoral system. I mean, it's preferable to the alternative, at least. But with workplaces, they're pretty authoritarian. I mean, they literally are. Uh, you can be fired for any reason. You don't get a say in the rules of that workplace. You don't really get a say in how your labor is expressed and oriented. These are all, like, really, really, really severe problems to me. I think they hurt people. I think it fucking sucks that most people will spend their entire lives utterly dependent on an authoritarian system to survive. I think it sucks that the average person will never have as much influence into the broader political system as small groups of, you know, corporate hegemonies uh, and, and business people and investors and capital owners and stuff. That bothers me. Now, my preferred system is not one which is oriented around hatred for any group. Not landlords, not cops, not rich people, all of these groups of people have the capacity individually to be good, hardworking, upstanding, moral people. But it remains a fact, nonetheless, that these people are complicit in maintaining the existence of this system. I would go as far as to say, I would, I would run this back. I don't think that every slave owner back in the 19th century would have individually been a bad person. I think that people's moral systems are largely molded by the world that they were born into. Uh, I think that the goal should always be to challenge the system and not to challenge the individual. To challenge the individual is exclusionary. To challenge the individual is reductive. But to challenge the system which we should be doing as intersectional leftists. This is what does genuine work. So then we ask, how do we make society better? Well, this is my goal. The first thing, and this, there is a three-way movement that we have to shore up on all fronts. The first two are, at least for now, more important than the last one. The first one is the culture war, baby. This is what I do. At the end of the day, political power is built by numbers. That's it. Support and public popularity are the bedrock of all populist movements, and we are a populist movement. Unless you want to do some weird, like, secretly become head of the CIA and launch a military coup for leftism kind of thing, which historically tends not to be how leftism is implemented in the real world. Our goals are to push people towards values that will make them more receptive to our political goals. So, here are some examples of things that we do to win the culture war. I'm about to list a lot of stuff, or at least I could. <sighs> Changing people's minds individually in person, debating people on Discord to try and get your views out there, making YouTube channels to disseminate information to people who want to find better criticisms of conservative values, debating conservatives, pushing values like, say for example, solidarity, camaraderie, trans rights, anti-white supremacy, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, and all other forms of progressive values generally into the broader public, petitioning these values to politicians, trying to get these values normalized in public discourse and in media, producing media that uh, normalizes these values. Hey, has anyone seen the season finale of Shira? Um, normalizing these values by pushing them in every media space imaginable, up to and including TV, movies, and what have you. Doing everything that you can to make sure that people are aware of the fact that there are um, alternatives to the um, to the um, uh, 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 to the pre-existing systemic hegemony. In person, um, we have um, we have. Uh, direct action. We have uh, working and volunteering. We have people who can engage in real life to convince people that the systems that they work within are not effective. You can create nonprofits. You can work at nonprofits. Everything, everything that you can do to convince people that our values are good and their values are not is building this. And you know this for a fact, we just talked to Chris Raygun. When Chris Raygun did his little videos, guys, I don't care what Sargon is saying or doing unless he's up to debate, okay? I, I genuinely don't care. He's a coward and he'll shit talk from behind a wall all he wants. I genuinely do not care. Um, we watched, the, we talked about the Chris Raygun videos when we talked with Chris Raygun. How many people do you think Chris Raygun red-pilled on anti-SJWism with his silly little music videos? 
How many, how many people do you think he got over? A hundred thousand? Two hundred thousand? A million people, possibly? Probably a lot of fucking people. Probably a fuck ton of people. Too many people, perhaps? Now, with that being the case, we have to recognize that a lot of the people who enjoyed the stuff that Chris Raygun produced, or that Sargon of Akkad produces, funnily enough, or any of these more reactionary content creators produce, pushes people towards political systems and political beliefs that normalizes the implementation of their actual policy positions. That's the main issue. The main issue isn't that if we have, like, anti-SJWs on YouTube, they'll be mean to people. The main issue is that anti-SJWs will usually have their views normalized um, through the, 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 the political space. Like, say, for example, voting for Trump, or say, for example, opposing the C-16 bill in Canada, or say, for example, uh, you know, voting in local conservative representatives for Congress and for Senate and for the gubernatorial seat and all that stuff. That's the main issue. Usually when I focus on these like cultural, like, oh, let's discuss this stuff, it's not just for harm reduction in the sense that I wanna make YouTube less shitty. I mean, that's nice, you know. The main issue is that people who are made less shitty also vote differently than people who are more shitty. And that's the real problem. The right, has done an extraordinarily good job advancing cultural conditions to bring people over into voting for conservative policies. It's very easy to do this for the right. Think about the uh, think about George Bush. Um, think about George Bush's approval rating immediately after 9/11. Stuff like being attacked. Stuff like an immigrant wave, stuff like a war being started, stuff like posturing, all of these things can get conservatives huge amounts of public support that will then lead into them being voted into power and then voted into power again afterwards. And that's a problem. So when we work towards normalizing political positions that are amicable to us, we're doing so in the eventual hope that we are able to get these positions pushed forward in actual spaces of power where it really matters. So let's talk about that. Here is what I would like to see. Leftism is not going to win the presidency. If Bernie Sanders had become president, even if he had become president, and it's not happening now, guys, I'm really sorry, but even if he had become president, he would not have been able to do that much on his own. The main reason for that is because he would have been limited to executive actions for imposing his will on the country. Now, you can do a lot with an executive action. Apparently these days, you can more or less declare war with it, since nobody respects the fact that Congress needs to approve a war. Um, anymore. That just seems to be something we've skipped by. But because the House and because the Senate were not amicable to his political positions, there was just no way he could have meaningfully changed things to the extent we would have liked. And frankly, I don't really want to implement leftist policies in this country through fucking executive action. Is that really the way we want to do it? Now, I'm not saying I didn't want Bernie to win. Of course I did, but we have to recognize the dude would have been working with a handicap. But doing this through executive action, just the president unilaterally doing this stuff? Uh... It's a bad precedent. And the next president can just undo it. Anything you do via executive action can just be undone via executive action. Whereas if you have it pushed through House and Congress and so on and so forth, it is much, much harder to undo that stuff. Much harder. That's why the Republicans weren't able to repeal the uh, entirety of Obamacare, because that was actually pushed through. It wasn't done via executive order. They were only able to get rid of the, um, the individual mandate. Courts can undo it also. Yeah, yeah, like, executive action is just not that useful. Long term. Not a great way of establishing long term political changes. So here's what we need to focus on, guys. And I believe in this very, very firmly. We need to go local. Remember that, okay? All the power, all the obfuscation Republicans are able to engage in in Congress and in the Senate comes from the fact that they have local representatives who are there who are able to contribute to the, frankly, current immovability of the senatorial process. We need to get involved in the local electoral processes. And lately, this has been happening a lot more with the Rose Caucus, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. If we can get 
more of our values push through these avenues, we have the ability to meaningfully affect change. Look at what has been done by AOC. Now, AOC has been doing an incredible job, in my humble opinion, not perfect, but very, very good. AOC has been doing a great job threading the line, simultaneously being very progressive, at least compared to the majority of the people in, in, in you know, the House and the Senate, and also working within the purview of electoral politics. Because keep in mind, if AOC just went out there on the floor and said, um, um, abolish the CIA, um, trans rights are human rights, um, uh, seize the means of production, um, uh, Medicare for all. I don't know if she would be able to affect quite as much, but AOC right now is one of the most popular politicians in the country and her influence alongside the other Justice Dems is so substantial that they're getting the opportunity to build panels within the DNC to uh, actually challenge people like Pelosi and some of the more establishment Democrats. That's incredible. That's insane. Pelosi has been in the seat of power for, I think, since the 1800s, maybe the 1700s. I think Pelosi might actually predate the American Confederacy. Um, and Pelosi has actually ceded recognition and ceded power in a way to uh, the squad. And they've done that because, and this is the important part, AOC recognizes the importance of public support. Everything that AOC does, everything she says, is part of a broader effort to normalize progressive and sometimes even socialist rhetoric. That's powerful stuff. Here's what I would like to see. This would be my ideal, okay? And I'm gonna hit it from the ground. A, a, a nationwide effort to start supporting, funding, and popularizing more progressive or left-wing democratic political candidates is established. These political candidates work locally to engage in the reenfranchisement of minorities in swing districts, which increases the likelihood of further democratic constituencies to be filled. In addition, they work as a coalition within Congress and within the Senate to begin advocating for a very specific departure from traditional DNC policies, which would, you know, we can talk about Green New Deal, we can talk about Medicare for All, we can talk, just broadly speaking, more progressive um, electoral legislation. We move in that direction, we strengthen this sect within the DNC, and we try to be to the DNC what the, um, what the more libertarian-leaning Tea Party ended up being to the RNC, substantially moving the party over. Eventually, I believe, more people are going, or at least a substantial number of people, are going to weigh in on the side of the Justice Dems, or whatever the future name for this group of people is going to be, than they would the uh, traditional establishment Dems. The establishment Dems don't really seem to have an interest in swing states or southern states. Imagine how much sway we would be able to get if we could have some more um, populist appealing progressives winning in swing states that the Democrats had previously ceded. If we work on giving these people like the resources necessary to set up polling booths or hey, to change the laws regarding felons being able to vote or not. Did you know that 1.5 million people in Florida, if my numbers are correct, I'm pretty sure that is the case, um, that 1.5 million people in the state of Florida are voting restricted due to some manner of brush with the, um, with the criminal justice system? Sargon, what's the chat? Okay, then I'll talk to him after this. Um, that's an insane number of people. 1.5 million people. That's fucking crazy. And if we're able to move more of these people towards, not only towards our positions, but at the very least being able to vote, we can slowly but surely start to push out the Republicans in the, yes, I did, the real red shirt guy. It reminded me of a very important thing. Um, there are, um, uh, uh, where we can start to push out not only establishment Democrat values, but also Republicans in the Senate and in the Congress. Ideally, what would happen after we have a very large and powerful populist group within the DNC is we can start moving people towards cultural positions that are going to make them amicable towards socialist ideas. The right does this all the time. The right will set up a... Um, 
the right will like uh pa- like uh like remember when Trump threatened to send um the uh, the military to the southern border to deal with the imposing threat of the migrants, and then it turns out the migrants weren't even there, and nobody actually cared, and it wasn't actually a big deal, and it didn't mean anything. There are a ton of ways in which conservatives posture to bring people towards emotional states which are amicable towards their political positions. If you get people scared about Muslims, if you get people scared about Mexicans, if you get people scared about immigrants, you can get people to move to the right. And we need to do something like that too. We need to start actively working towards, hey, this might be old hat. I think this can still be done at a federal level. We can work towards the prosecution of some of the executives on Wall Street who are responsible for the 2007 financial crisis. How popular do you think that would make it? Hey, hey, like AOC, imagine like AOC, you know, like up there, like, hey, Obama wouldn't do it, Bush wouldn't do it, Trump wouldn't do it, we're bringing these people to justice. The legality of this, I'm not entirely sure if that would be possible at this point, but something like that. Maybe make more of a public show of condemning some of these big CEOs who are engaging in obvious fucking, obvious fucking crimes against the American people. If you do that, you kind of build public support for people starting to distrust these groups. Maybe introduce a couple of legislative actions within maybe given certain districts or even certain states that um, de-emphasize the relative power of land Landlords. Hey, what if we start implementing a, what is it called? Right of first purchase? So that after um, businesses go under, before they're sold off to the banks, the workers have the opportunity to collectively purchase that business. We start implementing these policies incrementally up to a point where the general population is getting more and more sold on harder ideas. Not just Medicare for all, but stuff like full demod- decommodification of certain industries. If we can move people in that direction, there's a very real chance that we can do this over electorally. Now, mind you, and I'm being very, very, very simplistic here, mind you, with all of that being said, this is only reformist work. We can engage in this reformist work all day long, and we can go a long way with it. And I'm of the opinion, by the way, generally speaking, that when you show people positive examples of left-leaning values working, that's going to move them further to the left. But I am not of the opinion, at this particular moment, at the very least, that the full seizure of the means of production is something that we are going to be able to do merely through reformism and electoralism, by which the goal would be, if at all possible, to have as much support within the government as possible before any such thing happens. Now, I'm not advocating we start a revolution. I have always made the argument that the material conditions of our world, especially in a climate crisis world, will eventually lead towards some sort of extremely radical, violent action within this country's borders. And if that happens, it would be much easier for us to win if we are popular within the government. Because that will mean not only do we have seats of power within the existing government, it will also mean that a greater portion of the population will like us. That's what matters most at the end of the day. We work on the ground to make people like our ideas, and we put people in office who will disseminate policies that make them like our ideas. We make the world better now, but if one day this system really collapses, we will be in a position to win because I would much rather a violent revolution be uh, uh, socialist than one be fascist. That's what I would like to see for America. Now, of course, the specifics broadly vary, of course, and I would need to... And I would need to go over it, um, like on a state by state, county by county level if I wanted to be truly comprehensive, which I'm not going to because that sounds incredibly time consuming. But that's a general goal. That's why I care about socialism, that's why I care about market socialism, and that's why I want to achieve it in the way that I do. And I do think that voting for Biden is incrementally better in this respect for this plan of building socialism than having Trump in. If for no other reason than because if Trump is in for another four years in 2024, all the Democrats are going to care about is getting somebody, anyone who's blue in office. They're not going to give a shit about like gatekeeping or like holding people to certain values. That's why Biden did better than Bernie, by the way. A lot of people agreed with Bernie's ideas, but they voted for Biden anyway because they cared more about maximizing the chance of throwing Trump out than they did in actually making their world better. And that's what people are going to do. People will never like jump hard left, Democrats at least, because they're all spineless, because, um, because like Trump was bad or whatever. They'll just crawl to the easiest democratic position they can find. So yeah. And that would bring about ideally market socialism. And then afterwards we can work towards decommodification and so on and so on, blah, blah, blah. But hey, listen, 
one step at a time, baby.